We're at the Boxgrove site, the famous Boxgrove site in southern England. We're not far from the little village of Boxgrove um, and we're about an hour's walk from, from Chichester. We didn't walk here. Um, so behind us here we've got the actual main site of Boxgrove. In the distance we can see a lane running down the hill towards a farmhouse and on the left hand side of that lane uh, is quarry one where sinkhole or a water hole was found um, with stone tools and animals with buttery marks. On the other side of it, the right hand side, we have uh, quarry two That's and right. in it we had the uh, horse butchery site. Uh, horse was found by hominins and expertly butchered after the hominins left the site then, some carnivore marks were found on the remains as well. Uh, in about 2003, um, there was a project done at this site here and 42 other sites along this area to map the raised beach that once existed here. We're currently now on dry land and we're a good distance from from the shoreline at the moment but back 480 ish thousand years ago was an area of land quite close to the ocean and the area seems to have been quite quite marshy um, and it was a great magnet for various types of fauna in the, in the area. And there's a, obviously with the stream as well, yeah, fresh water. It remains one of the most uh, exhaustively studied sites, uh, Paleolithic sites in Europe. Um, so there's not very much more that we can get from it. Um, but given that, the amount of stone tools that were found at the site was just enormous. There was one very interesting point they discovered at this particular site. A lot of the stone tools that were left behind yeah, I was were going to mention that. Mm. It's an interesting point. The, uh, yeah, the fact that they, they, they found tools that were still usable, that were just discarded. Beautiful as well. Mm -hmm. Objects that were just, just so, so, so practical. And yet? And yet, there they are, just uh, left. So you're thinking about these hominins. It's, it's basically the beginning of what we would call the throwaway society. <laughs> this is when humans begin to throw things away, just randomly. Yeah. The washing machine breaks down, just buy a new one, don't get it repaired. Mm. Um, it seems to be, this is the, one of the earliest signs of that kind of society. I don't know, there's still the Magdalenians to come, they're kind of the contrary, aren't they? <laughs> there we go, there, there we go. go. I, think, I think one of the things that's quite amazing about this site now is that you're walking here you would not think that this area was once right up against the shoreline technically really yeah exactly technically speaking we should be drowning by now it, the site was was dated looking at the range of fauna that was found uh, the range of fauna that was found here mm. and there was an artist reconstruction done of of the various fauna that that existed here. So we had hyena, deer, yep. um, rhinoceros, bear, horse, um, and even megaloceros, the giant Irish deer, um, and beaver as well, along with wolf, and a number of uh, other micro micro fauna. Yeah, you'd find not in a glacial environment. Environment, yeah. yeah. It's, it seems more likely. It seems more likely that this site, uh, the the actual activities that were done at this site, uh, took place during an interstadial. Um, that interstadial, um, over four hundred and eighty thousand years of age. The thing is, the fauna that was found at this site compares favourably to fauna found at other sites. And those other sites have been accurately dated using radiometric dating techniques. So, this is the problem with it. 
when you look at the range of fauna that existed here, you're making an assumption that the fauna at this layer is the same type of fauna at the other sites, and those sites have been radiometric. Simil similar to the dating of Chidensis, for example. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's, it's only been what they call relatively dated. It's not absolute dating. Um, but it's the best that the archaeologists could use. Um, unfortunately, the sediments here were quite chalky and consisted of a lot of alluvial sediments. And given the nature of the site, it was right up against the shoreline. And, and those kind of environments may remain difficult to date. Yeah. I, I think that, that, that cliff there might be the most interesting feature really in the landscape. The fact that they had a, a, such a, a, a drop in, in, the, in, in altitude. Yeah. Uh, you said it was maybe a few meters. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not a, like a, a massive obstacle, but it's still, it could be an advantage for looking at a further distance, for, for, I guess. But, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, if, if you can imagine maybe a rhino down at the base of the cliff. Um, I, I haven't had a chance to go through the literature thoroughly, but based on the excavation photographs that were taken looking at the monograph, it seems the uh, cliff edge in, in some cases probably, probably measured uh, at, at the most about 20 metres in depth. But the area right here near Quarry 1 probably was no more than four or five meters, four or five meters high. But that information needs to be double checked or fact checked. Um, but it makes for a great vantage point, as Marlon pointed out, uh, to, to find uh, your prey essentially. You could hide out up, up on the top of the cliff and maybe a rhino or in, as in uh, Quarry 2, you have uh, the horse and then you can throw down uh, your wooden spears at the creature. Um, yeah, if, if, they, if they're close enough. I guess. Exactly. Yeah. And, you, and you can. You also use, you could use rocks, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, and also that river that it allows for easy access anyway between the two. The fact exactly. that there's a then the cut uh, a hole in that cliff. Yeah. Means you you have a slope. A there. slope to come down. Yeah. Yeah. And I uh, should I should explain that the the cliff face uh, probably runs for about. 26 kilometers uh, in length uh, from Westbourne to Arundel. And Arundel. Arundel. And the uh, cliff face here had a, a gap where a river flowed through. And so, uh, if you can imagine the hominins being up on the cliff, managed to subdue the horse from a distance, then could come down and finish off the job. Um, but how these uh, creatures hunted is very difficult to ascertain, especially mm. when you're dealing with periods so far back in time. Mm. One of the ways that we can kind of imagine how this may have gone down is by looking at uh, modern societies in the Kalahari and other parts of the world. When the Kalahari Bushmen go after their prey, they exhaust them. Mm chasing after them, not even running after them, but walking after them, looking for footprints in the soft sand and following them until they die of heat exhaustion. Once uh, they catch up with their prey, that creature has already just fallen to the ground with exhaustion. The Kalahari Bushmen gather around the creature and then give one final blow to uh, extinguish the life of, of the antelope or whatever they're eating. It might be more difficult to cause heat exhaustion in a creature at this latitude. You'd have to do something similar if you wanted to hunt something with a wooden spear. Yeah. Given that it's not the breast projectile weapon no. really. Yeah. They're very limited in range and efficiency. Yeah. So yeah, you're, you're gonna have to get up relatively close. Yeah. There's a, a famous site in North America called uh, Buffalo head smashed in. They would run herds of buffalo off the cliff um, and they would gather in, in a massive pile. Oh, yeah, I hadn't actually looked at it that way around. Yeah, and they could be the herds on the top. Yeah. And drill, drive from the um, And, and uh, they obviously they push them down at the bottom. At the bottom. Where they fall. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there's been some suggestion that if, if the North American Indians could do that with the buffaloes, 
um, humans uh, 500,000 years ago could have probably employed the same. The same but that's quite a strategic thinking already for, it is, for such yeah. early times, but I mean, yeah. it's not. It's not impossible. Uh, there's an, uh, one of the archaeologists that worked at this site uh, was uh, Dr. Matthew Pope who is now an uh, archaeologist at uh, University College London, senior lecturer there. Um, and he's currently working on a project in, on the island of Jersey. Um, and there's a site called Cot de la Saint Brelade, um, where if you look at the island and bring the sea level down to where it was so many hundreds of thousands of years ago, uh, you can see the landscape uh, you could see hominins like Homo neanderthalensis really using that landscape to their advantage. Uh, there was some suggestion that looking at the island, there are two headlands sticking out of the island, and if you had dropped the sea levels to the, to the level they were at way back at that time when that site was used, you can imagine gathering up all of a particular herd and herding them into the valley, trapping them so they can't escape. And then, basically, it's free-for-all to try and nab the weakest members of the group. Um, and that, that it's, uh, we can see some of this evidence at La Cotte. So using the topology of the land is a very widespread phenomenon. Yeah, anyway. uh, but we're seeing much more um, organized strategic activity taking place at La Cotte.